How's it going everyone? As always, my name is Jimmy Champagne and this is my channel PS Ready that's all about PlayStation. If you're new here, three times a week I round up all the best PlayStation news and I took a look and like 80% of you now are not subscribed to the channel. So if you enjoy this content, make sure you help me out and subscribe and set your notifications to all. And also if you really want to be generous, if you're already subscribed with your notifications set to all, make sure they're not set to personalized because that is like the worst system YouTube has ever implemented. It's so dumb. Yeah, either way, whether you've been subscribed for a while or if you're a new subscriber i really appreciate it i'm trying to get to 200,000 subs as quick as possible today's video is another rare single topic video i, I saw an interview with sean Layden talking about how exclusives are an achilles heel that uh, obviously expanded into a much bigger conversation and it really got me thinking about the path sony is on right now whether they have a bright future or a dark future so the way i broke this down is the bright future first mix of both kind of in between and then the dark future so hopefully you enjoy this video and you stick around for the entire thing. All right, so Sony right now is trying their best to carry the entire console ecosystem on their back. Nintendo is in a different spot, right? Like the Nintendo Switch is made for the most casual, like entry level, consumer grade, I don't know other adjectives for this, but like, you know, the basic gamer that wants to play Mario, right? Like they wanna play Mario Kart, they wanna play Mario Strikers, they wanna play Smash Bros. They're not like a hardcore gamer. So Nintendo has always always been able to rely on that except for when the Wii U came out of course and that thing was like an abysmal failure but like with the Nintendo Switch the reason that it has reached the meteoric success that it has is because Nintendo is trying to make games for everyone whereas Sony and I guess Microsoft to some degree are trying to make games that appeal to people a little bit older like that 18 to 35 age range they of course want to get the live services in there that capture younger gamers that love battle passes microtransactions free to play infinite playable games you know the stuff that older people like us don't necessarily love so they've been on this track for a long time now I would argue starting back in the PS3 generation where they got absolutely stomped by the Xbox 360 for I would say the first half of the generation but then they kind of like circled their wagons they got all of their best developers making these new IP first party games and they really were able to come back in a huge way to the point where the PS3 ended up outselling the Xbox 360 and then then in the Xbox One and PS4 generation, it wasn't even a contest, right? Like the games, the console itself, everything Sony was doing was basically them firing on all cylinders. We had to wait a little bit at the beginning of the generation for the big bangers to come out. But once they started releasing, it was just like AAA 9 to 10 out of 10 game after AAA 9 out of 10 to 10 out of 10 game. I couldn't have made that statement longer. And then in the PS5 generation, they said, hey, it worked in the PS4 generation. It worked in the PS3 generation. Let's just keep doing the same thing. Let's put out AAA experiences that are open world, third person action games, super high production values, and it's work, worked pretty well, right? Like the big difference is they weren't able to get PS5s in people's hands. That kind of scared third party developers into making a lot of games cross gen for the first half of the generation, but we have gotten quite a few great games and I'm playing one right now that I absolutely love. It's called Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. I don't know if you've heard about it, but there's been a looming problem with this philosophy, right? Like when you make a game and it takes off you give the developer more money to make the next game because you want that next game to be better right like nothing is worse to corporations than stagnation so if we just keep getting the same thing over and over again you're going to keep getting diminishing returns but a lot of people have been speculating that they might have hit their peak with the amount of people that they can draw in making better and better games for more and more money and of course we've seen this generation so far we're going to talk about it later in the video that that's kind of come back to bite pretty much every console manufacturer and every game publisher out there, right? Like they just all simply got too big and now they have to downsize massively. A huge component of that, of course, is like this situation where during the pandemic, during the like lockdowns and everything, everyone was stuck inside. So a lot of people who had never played video games before or people who played a lot of video games, but maybe fell off. And then the third component is people who normally play Call of Duty or Madden. They all started buying a ton of video games games, right? Because video games are a great way to pass the time. They're a great way to experience things at a longer format than you can get out of a TV show or a movie. So basically everyone and their mom and their girlfriend and their friends and their daughters and their sons, everyone on earth was playing a ton of video games. So Sony, Square Enix, Capcom, Xbox Studios, I mean, even Nintendo to some degree, they were kind of all at a crossroad where they said, hey, we 
can either hire a lot of people, start pumping out way more games and cross our fingers that the vast majority of these people who are playing games again kind of stick around once they can go outside again, or we could just keep the status quo that we're already working on, keep the budgets incrementally increasing, keep our headcount exactly the same as it is, and just kind of like ride the wave with everyone else because our games are going to sell either way. Hindsight being 2020, I think the second option would have been smarter because pretty much every publisher out there went with option A and now we're seeing a ton of layoffs. We're seeing studio closures. Like there's a mass exodus of game developers right now because the simple fact is every company out there basically overhired. And now that less people are buying games than they were in 2020 and 2021, you know, they're not making nearly as much money as they were back then. We saw this result with Sony's margins being 6%, which is basically like on all the games they sold, they made a lot of money, but they only made a 6% profit, which was a big drop from the usual 13% that they were able to like set their watch by for decades at a time. And because of that, Sony is at another crossroads where they have to ask themselves a question. Do we want to shrink the budgets of games and kind of go back to what we were doing in the PS4 generation with smaller teams making one game at a time that's within a reasonable scope and scale of budget? Or do we want to start making live service games that can kind of run in the background, sell battle passes, sell skins, sell loot boxes? Well, I guess those are illegal now in Belgium. My friend Locke told me about that. So no loot boxes, but like all the microtransaction-y type stuff that we've seen in games like Overwatch 2, Diablo Immortal, The Suicide Squad Killed the Justice League, Destiny 2, you know exactly what kind of game I'm talking about. So when you're asking the question, is Sony's future bright or dark? I think it's a little bit of a mix of both because I understand where they're coming from on a lot of levels, but I also think it's pretty fair to criticize either approach, really. So when you ask the question, is Sony's future for the PS5, the PS5 Pro, the PS6, and eventually the PS7, hopefully, like I hope consoles don't go away. Uh, when you look at that future, is it extremely bright or extremely dark or is it a mix of both? And I'm honestly in the mix of both camp. So let's start out with the extremely bright future. And for that, we need to look at a new interview with Sean Layden. He's the guy who was running PlayStation before Jim Ryan. And in my lifetime, at least there have been a few CEOs of Sony that kind of came and went, but out of all of them, I think my favorite favorite was definitely Sean Layden. I used to watch the showcases they would do at E3. I'd take off work and everything like that. And when I couldn't take off work, I'd watch them at my desk. And just like the way the dude talked about the industry, he has like a deep knowledge because it seems like he played video games, which is a big boon, right? Like you hear Jim Ryan talk about games and all he talks about is the marketing potential or the graphics. And, you know, he had things in check when he was the CEO of PlayStation. In a new interview with GamesBeat, he told them, exclusive is your Achilles heel. If you're spending 250 million, you want to be able to sell it to as many people as possible, even if it's just 10% more. The global installed base for consoles, if you go back to the PS1 and everything else stacked up there, wherever in time you look at it, the cumulative consoles out there never gets above 250 million. It just doesn't. The dollars have gone up over time. So what he means by that is like people continue to buy consoles, but like people go out of the market, people come in to replace them, and the number that they reach with the most successful consoles consoles ever, like the PS2, the Nintendo Switch, I think the Nintendo 3DS or maybe the original DS, they get close to 250 million units. It stayed pretty constant over time. And if the dollar stayed the same value, that would be completely fine because you'd be making the same money or a little bit more on every game you put out in perpetuity, like forever. But as time goes on, the dollar becomes less valuable. So if forever you only have at maximum 250 million people who are there to buy your game, the actual money you're making on that game becomes less and less and less over time. Now, there are ways you can supplant that by like making games cost more. 70 bucks was the new standard set this generation. And honestly, if you look at the math, that wasn't enough of a price increase for these single player games to recoup their budgets. I mean, I'll talk about examples in a second, but I mean, just look at Final Fantasy 16 and 7 Rebirth and of course, Spider-Man 2. I mean, all three of those games sold extraordinarily well. Spider-Man 2, obviously selling probably a lot better, I would say, than either of those two examples, but even with millions and millions of sales that would have gone a long way in past generations, they're all kind of breaking even or barely making a profit. So what he means by exclusivity being the Achilles heel, exclusives are great for selling hardware, they're great for selling first party games to people, but as time goes on and the budgets continue to increase and the dollar becomes less valuable, you need to sell more and more and more games to actually make a profit, but if your cap is always at 250 million, your amount of people who are even there to buy games is dramatic 
dramatically lessened. Because another thing you have to keep in mind is that the vast majority of people who buy a PlayStation 5, they're buying it for FIFA. They're buying it for Call of Duty and Warzone or like, you know, those games that come out every year that sell the most copies. They're for the normal person. And the people like us who buy games like Final Fantasy VII Rebirth or God of War Ragnarok or Spider-Man 2, that group of people is shrinking as time goes on because we're getting older. So when you talk about this bright future for Sony, I think they're already on the right path in one sense by releasing their games on PC. I know there's a huge subsect of people out there who think that's like an Achilles heel for them in their own way. I couldn't disagree more, honestly, as someone who has a PC and has a PlayStation 5. I can tell you personally, firsthand, my computer is like more than double the power of the PlayStation 5. I have the ability to run games that are 30 FPS on console at 60 FPS, 1440p without DLSS all day long and my computer barely breaks a sweat. But at the end of the day, a lot of these games like Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth, Final Fantasy 16, Spider-Man 2, I mean anything Sony really puts out, I always buy those games on PlayStation 5 for a few reasons. First of all, this one's going away, but they're there first, right? Like you get them first, you get them for the longest exclusivity period, they're there on day one, and we have the benefit with Sony where their games come out complete on launch, which is great. So you don't get that feeling a year later when the Ultimate Edition comes out on other platforms or comes to PC that you missed out on something, like arguably you're getting pretty much the same experience across the board. Obviously that reason is changing a little bit as we get to this day and date release strategy that they're working towards where they're going to release games on PS5 and PC. If you're worried about them releasing on Nintendo or Xbox, I would not even like have that thought in your mind. There's literally no financial incentive to release games on Xbox. The amount of money you have to pay to port them for the extremely limited user base that's been trained to subscribe to a service where they can get games for free. You're not going to sell games, right? You're going to sell a few. You're not going to sell enough to recoup that cost. So it probably wouldn't be worth it. And then the second reason I play these games on PlayStation 5 versus waiting for them to come to PC is I want to play them on my 70 inch OLED sitting on my couch, not with a nine foot controller, not with my laptop plugged into an HDMI cord. Like I don't love bragging, but I worked really hard to get my setup perfect upstairs. It's a no wires thing. Like I have a outlet behind my TV. I've got my PS5 behind my TV. All the wires are hidden. My sound bar is on a little rack underneath my TV. It's a very clean looking experience. It's a great place to just decompress and relax. We have movie theater seating in that room. I don't want to play them with my PC having to move around the house and like use the controller cord that comes with the DualSense Edge and all that. Games like Helldivers, I play those at my desk all day long. But a game like Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, there's no way in fucking, <laughs> there's no way in fucking hell I'm playing that on a 27 inch monitor, man. Like I need that good quality experience that only a console can provide. And sticking with this bright future path, I don't think it's necessarily bad that Sony is working on some live service games. I think this could have been a dark future path if they continued on what they were already doing, which is making like 12 live service games that they wanted out by the end of like 2025 or the beginning of 2026. I think that would have been a complete disaster because you're basically just throwing a bunch of stuff at the wall and hoping something sticks. And because of that, you would have seen a lot of studio closures. You would have seen a lot of layoffs and we wouldn't have gotten games from these great developers that Sony has that we would have gotten otherwise because they were spending their time making live service games. And as we've seen with games like Anthem and other huge failures like now Suicide Squad Kill a Justice League, you lose key talent from these studios in the path of development where to the point where Bioware isn't even the same company anymore. Like they shouldn't even be using the Bioware name at this point. I think we will see more bigger live service games from them, but like they've already shown that they're careful. So like, I don't really think it's not worth giving them the benefit of the doubt. And honestly, after reading what Herman Hulse said, where they want to make these big single player games that have high production values, but there needs to be money there to do it. They, I, I understand where they're coming from, where they have to make at least some live service games to at least appeal to a younger audience that's been conditioned to spend money that way with games like Fortnite and Roblox, for example. So the bright future really is a mix of both, in my opinion. I don't think it can really go back at this point to the way things were in the PS3 and PS4 generation, because there's just no way they're going to dramatically reduce budgets to the point where they really need to, to actually make money on these games. Like people always bring up Ghost of Tsushima as a great example of a cheaper game that goes toe to toe with other games in the Sony roster. Look, I love Ghost of Tsushima. I think the multiplayer is cool. The story gets really good, but when you compare what you can do in that game and the actual systems and everything to what you get out of something like God of War Ragnarok, for example, they're a little bit different, right? Like you can kind of see the reduced 
reduced budget on the screen, which is a phrase that uh, I think Hiroki Chitoki used when he said, could we see the double the budget increase on Spider-Man 2? In that case, I don't think you could, but uh, I think you kind of could see the reduced budget on the screen in Ghost of Tsushima. So the real only way is for Sony to make more live service games, but actually be careful about it, give them all a reason to exist, and maybe don't make them forever games, right? Like not every live service needs to last forever. And as far as the dark future goes, uh, it's just basically believing what all the Xbox are telling you on Twitter that consoles will go away, everything will be on PC, all of these big console manufacturers like Sony, Nintendo, and Microsoft will be third-party publishers just publishing their game on PC, everyone will just have a computer. I just don't think that's ever going to happen because computers are extremely expensive and as we've heard from Sony, the reason they're not price cutting the PS5 as much as they did with the PS4 and PS3 and PS2 and PS1 is that component prices aren't going down. They're staying stagnant or in a lot of cases actually going up. So there's no real incentive for them to like switch to PC because most people don't want to put in the time to get a pre-built or build a PC. So consoles going away, this eventual future of playing games over the cloud and like maybe downloading them to your PC or something. I don't think that's going to come true, especially in Sony's case or Nintendo's. I could definitely see Microsoft becoming a third party publisher because they love being reactive. They love shooting themselves in the foot. They love having bad PR. It's just the same problems over and over again pretty much every in perpetuity. And then of course, the second factor would be to continue on the path that they were on with Jim Ryan in the hot seat, which is making tons of live service games, throwing them at the wall, seeing what sticks. And then ultimately when the vast majority of them fail, because not only are live service games extremely hard to make, but also you're splitting your potential audience into the smallest little pie pieces possible. Uh, the studios will go away and uh, they'll have tons of layoffs, right? Like it's just not gonna work in that scenario. And then the third dark future option is they put out a ton of these live service games that they're working on and all of them are successful and then suddenly Naughty Dog, suddenly Sucker Punch, suddenly Ben Studio, suddenly Polyphony Digital, all of them are just in live service jail for the rest of their, uh, rest of our lives. Like I was going to say the rest of their careers, but really it would be forever, right? Like we would only see live service games going forward and it would ultimately spell the death of games like Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth and The Last of Us and every other game we love on PlayStation. And honestly, there is a future where that happens, but thankfully there's been a lot of course correction from places like Sony. So when you ask the question, is Sony on this path of like a bright future or a dark future or a mix of both? Obviously it's a mix of both, but I think as of right now, based on what we know, we have no reason to really doubt them. And as far as I'm concerned, I have never really felt more hopeful about being a PlayStation fan. I don't know. I just finished Final Fantasy VII Remake. I'm playing a uh, Crisis Core Reunion right now, and I just just started up Rebirth and I have a ton of great games that are exclusive to the PlayStation 5, whether that's timed or not, I wouldn't want to play those games anyway on PC because Square Enix is incapable of making a quality PC port, except for Crisis Core Reunion. But I don't think that comes down to their port being good. I think that comes down to the fact that they remastered a PSP game. So like if that didn't run, that would be an achievement in a negative way that they have never even accomplished at this point. 